Hello, it's good to start. So, um, we are very proud uh, that Mona has given us an invitation to be here. Um, and Mona will be using uh, uh, the board. Uh, yes, very old, old fashioned. Very good, very good. In the <laughs> so, uh, she's telling us about the kind of criteria and the spaces to make you age for more reasons. Uh, one hour, Mona. This is the Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. It's my first time in Miami, so this is Welcome. a great <laughs> opportunity. Um, and thank you for putting your trust in me, giving me the talk after lunch where you have to keep people away. <laughs> I'm probably not up to the task, but at least at least I cannot fall asleep now. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, the plan is to talk, um, talk about uh, Equivariant algebraic K theory and and spaces and how it relates to uh, to age cohortists. So let me just start with a very classical question and problem. Uh, so going back to the classification of manifolds, if you have M and N um, to loose uh, compact n dimensional manifolds and suppose that we know that m is homotopy equivalent to n we can ask uh, is m actually diffeomorphic to n uh, and the strategy to attack this question and you should tell me if you cannot so i'm planning to only use two boards so that we never go too low, but please tell me if you cannot, if you cannot see. And is that, you see everything? Okay. Um, yeah. Perfect. And tell me also if my handwriting is getting too small. Um, okay, so the strategy for attacking this, this question classically is uh, you can try to first construct an H cohortist uh, from M to N. So let me remind you what this means. So this is a cohortist. So it's an N plus one dimensional manifold um, with, okay, so the boundary is uh m Christian union n so this is a cobordis uh plus what makes it an h cobordis is we want the inclusions of these boundary pieces to be homotopy equivalences uh okay so for example <laughs> so i'm going to draw a little example right here the trivial h cobordis so m times i uh, a non-example, right, the usual cohortage that you first learn about, which is the pair of pants, right? So this is not an h cohortage because well, a circle is not homotopy equivalent to two circles. Uh, okay, so if you can do this first step, um, then you can ask the question, uh, is W, is it diffeomorphic to this trivial one? And if the answer is yes, uh, so if you can construct an H cohortist that's actually trivial, uh, then it would follow that M is diffeomorphic to N. So this is why we care, so because of this you know, classical classification, classification question is, uh, this is why we care about uh, obstructions to H cohortists. Uh, being trivial, and uh, it turns out that these live in a group. Okay, so the the classical uh, famous theorem, or I'm going to combine two theorems, so the theorem of Smale, and then the generalization by Barden, Mazer. 
and Stallings. Uh, so this is the H coordinates theorem. This is the classical version of the H coordinates theorem. Says that if uh, you have a high dimensional manifold, so dimension bigger than or equal to five, then isoclasses of H coordinates on M. are in one-to-one -one correspondence with elements of this group called the Whitehead group. So it's something that only depends on the line of M. Um, okay, so this is the first instance where algebraic K theory comes into the picture. So this group uh, by definition is defined as a quotient of a K theory group. So this is K1 uh, of the I1 M mod plus or minus the elements of the group, I want M. Okay, so let's see how much I want to say now about uh, K theory here. Well, it's gonna keep coming up, right? So we already saw K theory uh, in the previous talk by Carmen, which was already a you know, vast generalization of the you know, first forms of K theory. Right? So this is going back to the early definitions of K theory first algebraic K theory was first defined for uh, for a ring, and even before higher algebraic K groups were defined, uh, the first definitions of K theory were so K naught, the group completion of uh, the monoid of finitely generated projective modules, um, and isomorphism, well, up to isomorphism, and then K one. So let me maybe write it right here. So this also had a definition. So without using any higher machinery, this has a very algebraic definition, so K1 of a ring uh, in general is just defined as the abelianization of uh, the infinite general linear group. So, uh, and then the quest was to, to try to give a definition of higher algebraic K group that encompasses these existing ones in a meaningful way. But this, so this one is very, you know, explicit. Um, it's still, you know, hard to calculate in general these white groups. <laughs> Well, very hard, but um, at least we can maybe think through the computation together right now, uh, what it is in the case when I1 M is trivial. Okay, so in the case uh, when I1 M is trivial, so then we'll just K1 of V uh, and just using linear algebra, well, maybe there's also this uh, lemma of Whitehead that the commutator subgroup of GL, GLR, uh, you can identify in this case with S, with the general lemma, you can identify with uh, the group generated by elementary matrices. And then in the case of C, you can identify that with SLD. Okay, so the upshot here, so let's maybe uh, put it here in a little bo bubble, is so K1 of D, right, is going to be. Uh, so GLZ mod SLZ, so we just get the units. So plus minus one. So then we model but plus minus one, and well, this this side just becomes trivial. And this is the I think the only computation that we could do now in real time of a white group. <laughs> so it gets it, it gets very hard to compute, but there are other non-trivial ones. Uh, okay, but now in this case where pi one m is is trivial, right? We got that this side is trivial. Um, and this recovers Smale's result um, that, so he, Smale's result was in the case of a simply connected group. And the result was that every H coordinates for a manifold of, on a manifold of dimension bigger than or equal to five is trivial. So that's the classical H, H coordinates theorem. And then the generalization says, well, if you don't have a simply connected manifold, you can still, it's not a range for borders is trivial, but they are classified by the elements of this whitehead group. And just so that I can refer to this later, uh, just to give it a name, so to an H for borders, the element in the whitehead group that it corresponds to is called uh, the whitehead torsion. Um, but what part of this theorem says is that this whitehead torsion is equal to zero in this whitehead group, if and only if um, the H coordinates is trivial.
Okay, so that's the classical uh, H coborness theorem. So now, as you know, good homotopy theorists, we want to live to this uh, group level statement to an actual moduli space that includes, uh, you know, parameterized versions of this problem. So um, we can consider a whole space. Uh, of H coordinates on M. And well, there's different ways to define such a space. Um, and you can topologize it or you can define it as a simple set. And that's kind of the nicest way. But uh, the point is, so the, the zero cells are H coordinates on M. And then you, you define it in such a way that you have a path exactly when you have a diffeomorphism between H coordinates, And then you put in higher cells also. Uh, so this is defined in such a way that the pi naught, right? So there's a path exactly when there's an isomorphism between H coordinates, And um, to make things even more complicated, you can define a stable version and we'll see why we care about these gadgets. Uh, so uh, the stable, so the stability here is by increasing the dimension of the manifold. So you can cross the manifold with intervals and increase the dimension and then take a co-limit there. Um, okay, so how are these two related? So there's a theorem of Igusa called the stability theorem that says that if you look at the connectivity of this map, This is roughly n over three connected where n was the dimension of our manifold. So in particular, if your manifold is very, very highly connected, uh, sorry, if your manifold is very, very high dimensional, so if it's you know, going towards infinite dimensional, this map becomes uh, an equivalence. Um, and this is called a stable range. Okay, so why do we care about about these spaces rather than just just a group, uh, why not? So the reason is that um, this space, the stable one, so this is a main ingredient in um, computing the homotopy of the diffeomorphism group of M. So people care about Know, classifying man manifolds, but also diffeomorphism. So, you know, this is a big problem of interest computing the homotopy of diff M, which is a topological group. And uh, so let me tell you maybe just a little bit, but so this goes into a whole nother story of how this comes up. So um, the way the story goes is that there exists a fiber sequence Well, really two, but I'll tell you only about one. So this goes into surgery theory, which I don't know that much about, but so this is a whole orthogonal story that you know you can combine with uh, what I'm gonna tell you about to compute things about the diffeomorphism group. So there exists a fiber sequence um, that um, has B diff M in the middle, and then there's a bigger group called this tilde. So this is the what's called block diffeomorphisms. Uh, so the difference is uh, in diff M, a path is given by, by an isotopy. And in this bigger group, a path is given by a pseudo isotopy. Um, and then, OK, but anyway, you can ignore and just, so the punchline here is, so then the fiber is known to be this. And so suppose you want to compute this. Uh, then this is the part that is accessible by surgery theory, which means there's yet another exact se fiber sequence that fits that one in with other uh, things that you can compute using surgery theory. And then this is the, the part that's connected to uh, what I want to talk about. So this is computed 
uh, as, and I'm lying a little bit as an involution, this can be pretty tricky, but so this is the, the thing that's uh, equivalent to uh, the stable H coordinate space, but not always just in the stable range. So this was the stable range. Okay, so then the upshot is that uh, in good cases, when you can use surgery theory to compute this part, and um, when, well, if you could compute the stable H coordinates group, then this would give you this in the stable range, and then it would give you an answer here via the long exact sequence for homotopy groups that comes from this fiber sequence. Uh, and I'm not saying that these things are easy, but we'll see an application of, you know, somebody who computed something using this. So, Okay, so now we're motivated about why we care about the stable uh, H coordinates group, right? Because if you could compute its homotopy, then you could plug it into this computation to compute homotop homotopy groups of this M. And so here comes the big theorem. So how algebraic C theory is gonna come in again. Okay, so this is the theorem of Waldhausen. Uh, proposed in 82 and proved much later with Yar and, and Rognes. Um, so the theorem says that A of X, which is, so this is the algebraic K theory uh, of the space X, is equivalent to um, the suspension spectrum of X times another factor. Okay, so this here is just stable homotopy of X. And this other factor has the, uh, the property that if I plug in a manifold, then this becomes meaningful. So loops WHM is the stable H coordinate space uh, for M, a smooth, compact uh, manifold. Okay, so we still have that up on the board. So let, let me maybe draw the analogy right here. This theorem with a the classical H coordinate theorem. So what the classical H coordinate theorem said. So this was Smail, Garden, Mazer, and Stolens. Okay, so it's the result up there. So what that said was that pi naught of the H coordinate space uh, was the Whitehead group. So this was defined in terms of a K theory group. Uh, and what Waldhausen's result says. is that this is not, so this is not just a pi naught statement, but this is actually really a spectrum of space level statement. So you can lift this from pi naught and you can say that the entire H coordinate space um, is uh, expressed in terms of a K theory space. Right, so it expresses the entire uh, stable H coordinate co space in terms of algebraic K theory. Okay, so um, probably we will also black box, but I can tell you a little bit about what uh, so kind of algebraic K theory this is. All right, so this is still, so this was the whole reason why Balthausen defined algebraic K theory of, uh, well, what are now called Waldhausen categories. So algebraic K theory of categories with uh, with co-fibrations and uh, weak equivalences. So generalizing what Quillen had defined was algebraic K theory of exact categories, right, which break off exact sequences. So this still breaks off now exact sequences, but now you know co-fiber sequences. So this is not an additive category anymore. But in contrast to what Carmen was talking about, so this is very still very classical algebraic K theory that breaks off 
right? Its purpose is to break off exact sequences. Okay, so um, maybe just to give an example before moving on to the equivariant story, to give an example of how uh, how this was all used. Uh, so Farrell and Xiang, um, I know the years don't quite match. I guess people were, do, were publishing things after they were done. Um, but using all of this, uh, they were able to to give an answer to uh, to say what uh, pi i div n is. So it's still pretty restrictive. So it's rational, rationally. Um, and the answer is either q or zero. And this is if uh, i is equal to 4k minus one, k bigger than or equal to one, and n odd and zero otherwise. Um, and one more friction, also just in the stable range. So the relation between i and n has to uh, compare in that way that i is roughly less than n over three. Um, so, well, this is nice. At least there's some you know, answer in the range and at least rationally, but at least it shows that uh, diff the n is not that the homotopy is not always trivial. So this is in contrast to if you were to do homeo at the end, then that would be contractible. Um, so the, all those homotopy groups would be zero. Uh, so you know this this is still a big advancement at the time, and even now I think uh, this is not fully computed. But nowadays there's uh, a lot of work by Sander Cooper, and Oscar Randall Williams, and uh, other people trying to compute more of pi i of diff of disks still, uh, but beyond the stable range, of course, using other methods because algebraic K theory would will only get you this far. So that's you know the theorem that we're using that in the stable range algebraic K theory can compute that that fiber over there. Okay, and then in what goes also into this answer? So it's all of this. Right, that you can compute the part using surgery theory, that you can compute this part using algebraic K theory, but you can see that this is still only rational. And this is because, uh, so when you get to algebraic K theory, right, you have A, you're really looking at A of a point, the N is contractible. And uh, so that's also still hard and not completely known, A of a point, uh, but it has a map to K of Z which is also not fully known, but it's no rationality. And that's a rational isomorphism. So this, what plugs into this computation also is Borel's calculation of P of Z rationally. So when you plug in everything together, you can, you can get this answer. Um, Okay, so now let's uh, switch gears. And then the story I want to, to tell is what happens if G acts on the manifold. So now suppose that uh, we have, yes. We need two order generators. Uh, what is, what is going on? Like with N equals three? Oh, uh, also you, I don't, you cannot put, so this is still in the stable range. So it, it, uh, so uh, if you put too low, <laughs> um, yeah, and I don't know, I told you this comes from like plugging in. All, but however, there is a very nice, like in the four dimensional case, which was not covered by this course, there's this uh, recent work by uh, Watanabe. Are you familiar with that? That's, so th so that, that was like a, you know, huge breakthrough recently. And he has, so also it was not known if it's trivial or not. And he actually has some very nice generators like using uh, graph complexes uh, anyway, that's some other recent work 
that's very nice and actually very explicit also. Yeah, so this is not covered by this. Yeah, that's not in the stable range. And so this that was open. Uh, that was a big open question that he solved a few years ago. And yeah, and that's pretty explicit, like creating a map using graph complexes and actually finding some explicit elements in there to show it's not zero. Um, okay, so now let's suppose that uh, that we have an action of a group, uh, maybe for the purposes of the talk, G is going to be finite. Um, and so we can sorry, it comes from the field as well. What's that? Uh, yes, but can you describe them? Yeah, so that's for sure connected with. Uh, yeah, maybe, I'm not sure. Okay, so switching to the to the equivariant setting, uh, there's still a definition of an equivariant uh, age coordinates, and this is um, okay, so this is an age coordinates W such that so before we were asking that these are homotopy equivalences. And now the requirement is that these are G homotopy equivalences. And there is a lot of um, old work from the 70s and 80s on equivariant H coordinates and versions of you know, the equivariant H coordinates theorem and so on. Um, so let me just state a few. Okay, so Ilman uh, defined an equivariant whitehead group and the notion of equivariant whitehead torsion for an equivariant age coordinates. Um, Luke and how shield um, and Rottenberg. Uh, okay, so it's it's a little unclear who did what because uh, Everything is very nicely written in Luke's book, uh, algebraic K, well, transformation uh, groups and algebraic K theory, which was his habilitation script. So, so it's an account of everything that had been done at the time. And sometimes it's a little hard to figure out, you know, which ones are his results and which ones are uh, other people's results. And sometimes in there also there's somebody's paper which is like left as an exercise. It's an exercise, and then <laughs> you see a reference, and it's like a whole paper. Uh, but it really contains, you know, it's, it's a very rich uh, book that contains a lot of stuff that uh, I think, you know, with a lot of effort, like I understand just little bits of it. Um, but one of the results for sure is that this whitehead group that had been defined. Um, is shown to decompose into a direct sum over conjugacy classes of uh, non equivariant whitehead groups um, of terms. Okay, so these are the fixed points of M. And on the, on the fixed points, G doesn't act anymore, but we have this residual action of the vial group. So this is the normalizer of H mod H. If H is normal, then it is just G mod H. And then these are the homotopy orbits. Okay, so if you have seen um, equivariant stable homotopy theory, that should look, this kind of decomposition should look oops, pretty familiar. Um, right, so the goal, right, well, in case you haven't guessed, is going to be to do some kind of equivariant version of this. And um, 
well, so we already see that on pi naught, whatever we want this white hat thing to be. Um, so we see this kind of decomposition, and maybe I'll say this again in a little bit, but if you have seen some equivalent stable homotopy theory, uh, then there's a famous you know, splitting also of the suspensions, equivariant suspension spectrum of a space, which looks exactly like that. Uh, so in the quest of such a definition of equivariant A theory that would fit into this kind of theorem, uh, this was um, way back with Perry Malkovich. This was in 2000. 19, we showed that, uh, so constructed that there exists a G spectrum, um, a G of X or a G space X that has a splitting. So if we look at its fixed points, it splits over conjugacy classes into terms exactly like that. So fixed points of X and then take the homotopy orbit with respect to the bio group. Um, okay, and this was not uh, so easy. So the most naive thing that you can do doesn't work. Um, so maybe let me just uh, give a warning. So if you just use, um, so this is not using what some people maybe Claire far we could call K theory of group actions. Uh, so what that would give, okay, so maybe let me just point this out. So I didn't say before how we construct A of X, right? I black boxed it and I said, well, we're using K theory that splits exact sequences. Um, Right, so we plug in some Waldhausen category, a category with co-fibrations and weak equivalences, but maybe I should tell you now, so the category that's plugged in to, to define A of X is the category of retractive spaces over X. Um, so spaces that have an inclusion from X and then a retraction to X that compose to the identity. Uh, so those are the objects and then you know, maps of such. So if X is a G space, it's not hard to see that then G just acts on this on this category, you know, simply by uh, conjugating the inclusion and the retraction. And then when, you know, you put a G inverse on one side and the G on one side, and now when you, uh, well, they will compose to the identity. So you get another retractive space. Um, so this is a category with, with a G action. Uh, so it's a Waldhausen category with a G action. And then there is a way, um, so if you just have a category with a G action, we were to do the usual construction, we just simply get a spectrum with a G action. Well, that's for sure not what, what we want. Uh, so, well, I don't know uh, how much I should go into uh, I could give a little, do people want to see a little crash course in equivariant spectra? Is it genuine G spectra? Yeah, genuine G spectra. Uh, I could do it by request or not. Why not? Why not? Why, no, why not use it? No, why that, what does it mean? What? Yeah, so, well, so there's a few layers. So first, like we don't just want a naive spectrum. Uh, so, I, so I'm wondering if I should say, um, so, or are people happy with wanting genuine? I want to see it. Okay, you want to see it. Okay, let's, uh, we can Start maybe. Starting. No, 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 it's, uh, the, 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 that's very good. Uh, if you, thank you for uh, being great to request it. <laughs> uh, I'm wondering if maybe, okay, no, let's not do it on the sideboard. Uh, but if you leave the, the, the one behind. Oh yeah, let's, let's leave this one behind and then we'll put it down and. <laughs> uh, yeah, so a little bit of a side story. Um, I, I mean, I think this is very good. So who knows, maybe this will be the only thing that that you will uh, remember from the talk and, and that will also be, be very good. Um, so remember, uh, right, that in general, um, if we ask, so given a collection, uh, so a sequence, 
Okay, so this is uh, a side, right, a little crash course on what we want G spectra to be. So given a sequence of spaces, uh, Pn, right, you can ask when do the functors Uh, so let's say I define E and dash to be homotopy classes of maps into the n space. So when do these define um, a cohomology theory? Right, and by cohomology theory, I mean something that satisfies the axioms homotopy invariance, uh, suspension, co-fiber sequence, additivity. So all of them, are actually very not hard to see just formally, except the, the one that requires something additional is, right, so we need the suspension axiom. Um, so we need E and X to be isomorphic to T and plus one suspension X. So for this, we want X uh, Pn to be suspension X Pn plus one, and now by an adjunction, uh, I can move this to loop. loops on the other side. Okay, so in particular, it, or I don't, well, let me say the claim, right? So we see that if we have the Pn is equivalent to loops Pn plus one, then this holds. And the claim is for a sequence Pn with Pn is equivalent to loop and plus one, uh, we get a cohomology theory. So this axiom holds and so do the, the rest. Um, and well, and then Brown representability says that all cohomology theories, so we see that every that thing that we call a spectrum represents a cohomology theory and also, conversely, all cohomology theories are represented okay, by spectra. Okay, so this was no G yet. Okay, but now if you want to answer the question, so what is a G spectrum, right? The, the question that we really want to answer, right, is what is, so we want G spectra to be something that represents equivariant cohomology theories. So what is equivariant cohomology? Okay, and then there's uh, many uh, possible answers here, right? So version one uh, would be Borel uh, cohomology. And so this, by definition, you can define Borel cohomology of a G space X uh, to be the, the usual cohomology of the homotopy orbits of X. So EG times over GX. Okay, so. Oh yeah, sorry, thank you. Yes, I want to erase the G, that's right. Yeah, so that's usual cohomology uh, of the homotopy orbits. So, um, yeah, so what is the issue? So, this, well, this is a valid, you know, answer, and it's used in very many, uh, you know, areas of math. And usually, for many people, this is what equivariant cohomology means, and it's right. So, it's very useful in many computations. Uh, but the issue for homotopy theorists is that uh, well, one is, so this sees too many equivalences. So this is invariant and this notion will come up over there too. So invariant uh, with respect to what I would call coarse equivalences. So these are equivalences G maps um, and just underlying equivalences. Uh, where, whether, and we care about, so to do a covariant homotopy theory, um, as I think many people in this room care about, uh, we care about equivalences on 
the equivalences that induce equivalences on fixed points. And then um, Poincare duality, you can see also does not, um, well, Poincare duality uh, also does not hold, except, um, well, very restrictively. So, um, for example, if you just even take orbits, G mod H does not hold. Right, so even for for orbits from the maybe just holds for it, it only holds for free man, G manifolds, um, but it doesn't even hold so only for free. But even for orbits, so then you can do this calculation. If you plug in an orbit here, you just get the homology of BH, and dually you get the well, homology and cohomology of BH, which is just group homology, and you can. Well, and you can calculate group homologies and see that those are not definitely not uh, not dual. Okay, then um, version two is uh, Redon cohomology, which um, so this is computed using a chain complex that you build out of equivariant cells. So um, using the chain complex um, from a GCW structure. So let's do an example. Let's see if I can get uh, this example again. So I'm gonna do an example, uh, the example of S2 with C3 rotation action and just put a, a CW structure on it. I'm not gonna compute the Verdun cohomology, but we're gonna see kind of what, um, well, maybe let me say, say, tell you what's good here. So for Verdun cohomology, if you compute it, so using a chain complex that you build out of the DCW structure, um, you do get, so this is invariant uh, under uh, these G, Weak equivalences, so equivalences on fixed points. Um, also, let me maybe say that um, so this definition is not going to have the coefficients are not going to be in a group, but they're going to be in um, what's called the coefficient system. So coefficient system. This is um, a functor from the orbit category. Two abelian groups. Okay, so this is this is good. It means that, and also it's defined in such a way that if you plug in an orbit, it really does satisfy the dimension axiom on, or not just on a point, but on orbits. So if you plug in an orbit here, it recovers the value of this coefficient system at that particular orbit. Um, okay, but then it's still not. Great, because so let let me do this example. Um, I think I have it drawn somewhere. Okay, so um, we don't have colors, so I'm just going to have to explain it. In mm, yeah, there are no colors. Does anybody have color markers? <laughs> Yeah, don't worry. Don't do, please the right one. Like, oh, there's a red one. Okay, at, at least at, at least we can try to use this. Uh, okay, so let's maybe use the red one for the fixed things, and then uh, I'll keep using the black. Okay, so this this is a fixed cell, and that's a fixed mirror cell. And now the ones that are not fixed, um, I'm. I'm supposed to attach together with the entire orbit. So this is another zero cell, but now this is a free type, right? So cells, let me see, remind you here. So cells in a GCW uh, structure are of the form. So they're not just disks, but they're disks times an entire orbit. So every disk you attach together with its entire orbit. So the slogan is orbits take the, the place of points. Um, okay, so here we have, um, 
another zero cell, which is of the free type, so it comes together with its entire orbit. Um, then uh, I'm going to attach this one cell. So it's this one cell, but this also comes with its entire orbit. Then this one cell that also comes together with its entire orbit. Then this other one cell here. So in total here, we have three one cells that are all of three type. They, they all come with an entire orbit of three things. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna attach um, a two cell. Uh, so we're gonna have this two cell. So let's say I fill in this two cell, but this also comes with its entire orbit. So it's gonna be those uh, four, sorry, those three triangles. And same on the bottom. Okay, so now if I look at uh, dual story, um, so if I try to think about the proof of Poincare duality, which, uh, right, you look, you want to find the correspondence between the cells and the dual cells. Okay, so this two cell now is going to be a zero cell. So I'm going to have uh, three points here, and then same for these two two cells. Their duals are going to be these zero cells. Um, now for the one cells, so the one cells will still be one cells, but now these will look as okay, this. So these are all of three type still. Um, then the dual to these one cells are going to be these one cells. Again, of three type. Now the dual to these zero cells are going to be these two cells that I can fill in here. So now it's all drawn out except the two cap. But now look at the, the dual of the red. So these are not of the type. So not of type uh, D2 times an orbit anymore. So these are now the caps. If you think about it, this now really does have the rotation action on it. I'm not just taking a non equivariant cell and rotating it around. So these are representation disks. Um, so, okay, to jump right way ahead so that we can get back to the main story. So the solution here is you can bump this up in order to really be able to incorporate this to a version where you just lift the Bredon cohomology. Um, so, sorry, I should put this here, ROG graded. So one solution to this is to incorporate the representations. So if this is now graded on representations and there's now this corresponds to spectra graded on representations. So you have a value for every V and that will give you, uh, and the cohomology will be graded on representations and it will incorporate a suspension isomorphic like this with respect to representations also. And yeah, so there's no way you could get any form of Poincare duality unless you incorporate the representations in some way like that. So just the Z-graded Bredon version does not see it, but you can bump it up to, to give values for representations. And this is what's called the genuine D spectrum. The one that's, you know, so this would be the ordinary one, the Bredon one, that satisfies the dimension axiom. And if you remove the dimension axiom, that's how you get generalized equivariant cohomology series graded on representations. Okay, so now getting back to this. So this is what we really want. We want a genuine G spectrum that corresponds to one graded on representations really. Uh, but more than that, um, so if you if you were just to do the naive version to get a spectrum with the G action, that would correspond to the version where you just get the Z graded, you know, version of of a cohomology theory that on G spaces. So we want, you know, the fully equivariant one. Uh, but the other issue that arises here, so if you just use this category with G actions, um, so you can it's homotopy fixed points are what you want to look at. Um, and secretly, we're using the technology of what are called spectral Naki functors, which is another characterization of G spectra here. Instead of looking at the values of the spaces, you can, by uh, 
new theorem, you can actually look at the spectra, the fixed point spectra at every level and connect those up with uh, restriction and transfer maps. So at level H, you'd want to look at this. So this is H equivariant retracted spaces, H maps, but only coarse equivalences. So this was uh, Bernardo's question. So you really want genuine equivalences also. So basically you want to change the definition of equivalences in each one of the fixed points and then assemble those together. And that will give you something that has this kind of splitting. So if you just do this, you get something that we called uh, coarse A theory, which is also interesting. It's connected to this bivariant A theory of Bruce Williams, but it's not gonna have this, this splitting. Okay, so now, um, in the last 10 minutes, so let's get back to this main story. Uh, well, this is great. I can now use uh, do the thing you're not supposed to do. And, uh, and yeah, so just put G's everywhere. So the conjecture is, right, that uh, we would want this to be, uh, right, so now this is, uh, equivariant algebraic A theory of the space, which we already defined. And we'd want this to break off the, um, the stable G homotopy of X. And let me tell you uh, a theorem about this. Right, so this is called the Tom Geek splitting theorem. Right, so this is what happens. So if I put a G here is, as we were saying before, we incorporate all the representation. So now I just don't, don't suspend with respect to just spheres, but with respect to all representation spheres uh, when I define this object. And it gets very complicated. So the fixed points, if you've never seen this before and think it might just be the suspension spectrum of the fixed points, that's far from the truth. Uh, but it has, for a GCW complex, it does have a nice, uh, formula, which is this uh, Tom Dick splitting. Uh, so it's the suspension spectra of terms just like that. So we keep seeing this decomposition. Um, okay, so that also indicates, right, why we definitely want such a decomposition in our definition. Uh, okay, and then part of the conjecture should be that if I take, uh, so if I take this for a manifold and um, right, I um, and I take the fixed points, I would want this to be some space of equivariant H coordinates. Okay, so maybe. Um, so let's, um, so another thing that, that Carrie and I have proved more recently is that there does exist a map uh, from the suspension G spectrum to this A theory spectrum. Um, and the fiber, okay, so now when I write M, I just mean instead of any space, I plug in a compact smooth G manifold. So when M is a smooth G compact, compact G manifold, um, the fiber for X is a manifold uh, on fixed points is, uh, Again, has this decomposition. So basically, this is all rigged so that it's compatible with these Tom Dick splitting. splitting. Okay, so basically, what we want um, to show from here on, right, is first that there exists a stable equivariant each coordinate function uh, from compact, smooth. G manifolds and embeddings <coughs> um, to spaces that 
you know, spits out some kind of uh, stable base of H coordinates. Okay, and it turns out that this is pretty tricky because, uh, well, you'd think that you can bump up from the literature, but um, unfortunately, this is being reported. So <laughs> uh, it turns out that there is a lot of hand waving to see the list released in the literature about the H coordinates functor being a functor. Uh, so this is actually quite subtle. So I'll say maybe a few words in the last minutes, but. Um, so let's maybe first answer the question, what does stable in this equivariant case mean? And you can probably already expect the answer because we have seen a lot about how representations come in over and over again. So let me tell you this old theorem of Araki and Kawakubo. Um, so their theorem, so this again, it was, a group level statement from way back in the 80s or 70s. So this is an equivariant version of the of the H coordinates theorem. So what they say is that if this is an equivariant H coordinates, um, this white equivariant white torsion. So remember before the classical result of the H coordinates theorem, or part of it was that this is zero in the white group if and only if W is trivial. So equivariantly, that's not exactly the case, but this, the statement is that there exists a representation B such that if I cross uh, W with the representation, this, this is trivial. Okay, so hopefully this motivates enough that stability in the equivariant case for equivariant H coordinates should be a co-limit over representations of spaces of equivalent H coordinates, but instead of crossing with intervals, we want to cross with representation disks. Um, okay, so, and then part two, that we'd also want to show to, in order to relay this fiber with a space of actually equivalent H coordinates, right? So this was just, we just showed that the fiber here, right, splits as these non-equivalent H coordinate spaces, but there was nothing equivalent here. So what we'd want to show is that there exists a space of equivariant H coordinates, equivariant H coordinates, the stable space, and if itself it has a splitting like this. Uh, okay, and then this part one and two are uh, joined not just with Kerry Malkiewicz, but also so still with Malkiewicz but also with good willy. And Ibusa. Okay, so now I think I have uh, minutes left. So maybe I can just talk about, uh, so maybe in the last few minutes, I can just point out why the functoriality there is, is, uh, is quite subtle. Or even before, even before thinking about functoriality, even just defining the stable, the, the maps in the stable space is quite subtle. The functoriality. Okay, so um, instead of thinking about the H coordinates for the last few minutes, I'm gonna just because it's simpler, I'm gonna think about pseudo isotopies. So H coordinate spaces and pseudo isotopy spaces are related by looping. Uh, so this is very close to it. Okay, so a pseudo isotopy is a diffeomorphism of M times I. Um, it's a diffeomorphism such that um, its identity on M times zero uh, union the boundary of M times I. Okay, so how would you even define a stabilization map? Um, so given a pseudo isotopy, you could think, okay, so first if you cross everything with I, it's not gonna work because it's not gonna satisfy that condition. So you want to define 
a map like this. So let's think about let's think about it pictorially. So this is i times i, and every point in here, think about it as being crossed with m. So every point in here is a copy of m. Um, so I could take so on, I could put f on each one of these rays. Uh, and just make this identity outside. Okay, since I'm running out of time, maybe I'll just say things in words from now on and hand wave my uh, the picture and then, well, you can ask more questions later. So this would not be smooth, right? So the problem here would be that this is not, um, you need to put a condition to ensure that this is smooth here. And the condition is you could just ask for this to be, to be for the product at the top, near the top. But then if you do that, and you do the stabilization once that loses the condition. Um, so, so it's not good. You're not going to land in, in, in the space of pseudoisotopies that still have that condition. Then the second idea, which was Kiyoshi Gusa's idea in his stabilization paper, is to instead do a U-shaped stabilization and put F on each one of each one's of these rays and then make this whatever your diffeomorphism was at the top and identity here. And that's nice. At least you can define the map. So now everything is rigorous, but it's still very hard to, to work with. So the, the best idea that also comes from Kiyoshi's uh, treasure box is to instead double all your pseudoisotopies or H coordinates. So instead of working with one, just think of the space where each one is somehow double and then stabilize in the same way. But now some magic happens when you double it that uh, you can use some analysis, little magic of even and odd functions, and this actually becomes smooth when you do it. So this problem goes away. It's really kind of like magic. Um, and not just that, if you do it twice, if you stabilize with respect to vector space once and then twice, or if you do it with B plus W two vector spaces at once, you also get equal things, at least in the case of pseudoisotopies. And in the case of H coordinates, well, you have to define a diffeomorphism between the iterated one and doing doing it in sequence, you know, and assemble of all of the data for functoriality. But still, uh, it's very nice. Okay, so I think I should stop here. <laughs>